Now that we've talked about logarithmic and exponential functions and have seen some applications with them, we will move on to talking about calculus involving those functions, which of course starts with the ability to take derivatives of them. I'm not going to derive the very first rule I'm going to give you, but the derivative of e to the x is kind of what makes it one of the nicest functions to study in calculus because its derivative is simply itself. Okay, so you can think of e to the x as being a very egoistic function because it likes itself so much, its derivative is simply itself. This is not quite the case with the exponential functions of different base. The derivative of that here will also be itself, but then followed by the ln of the base. Notice that it's actually kind of the same here. This is followed by ln e, but ln e is one. For a quick example here, let's take a look at how one would take a derivative of, let's say, e to power 3x, okay? So remember that all of the differentiation rules we've covered up until now will still apply no matter what the function you're taking the derivative of is. So if you have a product, you will have to apply the product rule. If you have a quotient, the quotient rule. If you have an inside and an outside function, you will have to apply a chain rule, okay? So in this case, this is exactly where we see the chain rule first applied to exponential functions. We have not just e to the x, but rather e to some other power, 3x. So here, we have to pause for a minute and think about what is the inside and what is the outside function. So this function e is actually the outside, and my power in this case is the inside function. Remember the chain rule? The chain rule says to first take a derivative of the outside function, keeping the inside as it was. So the outside function is e to some power, which has the derivative as itself. So the outside derivative is simply e to power 3x, followed by the derivative of the inside. The inside here is 3x, the derivative of 3x is simply 3. Okay, you will do more examples in class, but let me just do one other one here. What if we were to take a derivative of, let's say, e to the power x squared plus one? Same idea. Now we have the outside function is still e, the inside is still the power. So I'm going to take the derivative of the outside first and keep the inside intact. So the outside function is e, its derivative is itself. So e to whatever power it happened to be, x squared plus one, followed by the derivative of the inside, two x, okay? Now this is for the derivatives of the exponential functions. What about logarithmic ones? So the function, a logarithmic one, let's take a look at the one with base e, because again, that's gonna be the one that we mostly work with anyways. So this is the function whose derivative I'm after. So if it's, y equals ln x, it's y prime that I am seeking. Now, we already know how to take derivatives of exponential functions. So the, as the first step, it would make sense to transform this function into an exponential function whose derivative we already know how to take and then apply implicit differentiation, okay? So as the very first step, I'm going to rewrite that as the exponential function. There's a couple of ways to think about it. I know you guys have practiced turning exponentials into logarithms and back. So turning this into an exponential function, you should get e to the power y is equal to x. Now, once again, I already know how to take derivatives of exponential functions, so I can simply apply in Implicit differentiation to this entire equation. Okay, so we will take a derivative of that as is. What do we get on the left hand side? On the left hand side, we have e to the power of something. So the derivative here is itself, except for the inside of it is not just x, but y, which is a function of x, which means that, as implicit differentiation suggests, I should follow up by the derivative of y, which is y prime. It's implicit differentiation. I don't know what y prime is. I'm just going to keep it as a packaged deal here. And then equals to the derivative of the right-hand side, the derivative of x is just one, so I have just one. Now remember, I'm after y prime, so I'm going to solve this equation for y prime. What do I get? I get one over e to power y. And this is allegedly my answer. So the derivative of ln x is one over e to power y. Preferably, 
my answer will only contain x's. So I'm wondering if I can replace this y with some x, with the function of x that it corresponds to. And remember that y itself is just ln x. So if I plug it back into here, what am I going to get? I'm going to have one over e to power ln of x. E exponentials and logarithms are inverses of each other. So I'm going to get simply one over x. Excellent. So that means that the derivative of ln of x is just one over x. Okay. And once again, all of the same differentiation rules that we have seen before still apply to this function here. So for example, um, ln of let's say 5x, the derivative of that. So here, once again, you have to think about what is the outside function and what is the inside function, because clearly the inside is not just x anymore. In this case, logarithm is the outside function. It's a logarithm of something. So this guy is the outside function. And whatever lives inside of it is then the inside function. Okay. So as per chain rule, I first take a derivative of the outside, which is ln of something. And the derivative of ln of x is just one over the inside. Keeping the inside intact, the derivative of ln of 5x is first of all one over 5x, one over all of the inside times the derivative of the inside. The inside is 5x, the derivative of it is just fine. Okay, and that's your answer here. Just for a little bit of extra practice, maybe try taking the derivative of x times ln x, just to remind yourself that all of the differentiation rules will be inherited for all the functions. So here, it's first of all a product, which means that we will have to apply a product rule and then whatever other derivatives that we need to take. Equipped with the now newfound ability to take derivatives of exponential and logarithmic functions, we can move on to talk about how to do calculus using those functions. So how to find global or local maximum minimum, inflection points, sketch the functions, and so on. Our first application is that of cardiac output, which is the volume of blood pumped out by the heart per unit time, or sometimes measured as per heartbeat. One of the most common techniques to actually measure the cardiac output and therefore how well your heart actually pumps blood is through thermodilution. Believe it or not, this is a minimally invasive procedure that can be done bedside, but it involves inserting a catheter into the heart and then as it goes through the right atrium, releasing a small amount of cold dextrose or saline solution, and then tracking how the temperature of it changes on heart's exit, okay? So here in, at the exit of the pulmonary artery, okay? So the, the cold temperature of the actual solution warms up as it travels through the heart, and the faster its temperature returns to normal, the better your cardiac output actually is because the faster your heart managed to get that solution out. The reason that this is preferred by many is because again, it's minimally invasive um, and it can also be repeated. So normally there are a couple of injections that happen and an average of the cardiac output um, among different measurements is taken. Um, the other nice thing is that because this is all automated, we actually know what a normal temperature variation curve in this process looks like, and it can be modeled closely by a function like this. So here we have 0.2 t squared e to the minus t. This shows the temperature in degrees Celsius and t is measured in seconds. So this will tell us what the temperature is seconds after the injection of the cold solution into the heart. We would like to find, classify, and interpret critical points of this function as well as to sketch it, which means that we have to pull out all of our calculus arsenal, take the first derivative, find critical points, take the second derivative, find inflection points, talk about the intervals of increase, decrease, as well as concavity, and then put all of this information onto the graph. So let's first take a derivative. Let me rewrite the function so I can analyze it a little bit closer before actually differentiating. So first and foremost, notice that this is 0.2 t squared times e to the negative t, which means that before anything else, this is a product, and therefore we will have to apply the product rule. 
Okay, so remembering the product rule, I'm going to have the derivative of the first function, which here I'm going to consider to be 0.2t squared. So the derivative of that is 0.2 times 2t, and then we leave the second function alone, plus we leave the first piece and take a derivative of the second function. So now I have to take a derivative of e to the negative t, which is itself, times the derivative of its inside. Its inside is minus t, so the derivative of that is minus one. Now, in order for me to better see what is actually going on here, I'm going to try to simplify this expression by factoring things out. So I'm going to look at both of these terms and see what it is that they have in common that I can take outside of the brackets. Clearly, they have a point two in common. There's also a factor of t here and here, there's actually t squared, so I'll be able to take one of them out. And there's also e to the negative t in both terms. So I can take out this entire um, factor, and then what I will have left, well, let's say I took out 0.2, I will have two left here, I took out the t, and I took out e to the negative t. So from the first factor, I, from the first summand, I only have two left, and from the second one, we took out 0.2, one of t's, e to the negative t. I will have minus one remaining, and I will also have a little factor of t there. So altogether, there will be two minus t left in the brackets. Okay, sorry. Um, so for the critical points here, again, remember that I need to set my derivative to be zero or does not exist. Factoring is particularly helpful for solving something to be zero because factoring turns anything into a product and a product is only zero if one of the factors is zero. So here I simply need to now analyze this entire expression factor by factor. Point two can never be zero. t is zero when t is zero. e to the negative t, which is our next term, is never going to be zero. No matter what power you raise e to, it's always going to give you a positive result. And this is one of the nicest things about analyzing exponential functions. You can think of that in terms of the graph, or you can actually think about that in terms of raising something to the power. No matter what function I pick, what number I pick, if I raise e to that number, the result will always be positive. So e to the negative t is never zero, so that produces no solutions. And this bracket, 2 minus t, is equal to 0 when t is equal to 2. So those will be my two critical points, 0 and 2, um, from this case. And then I also need to consider, when does the derivative not exist? Well, let's take a look at the actual derivative. This is it. Are there any numbers that I will not be able to plug in? Well, not really. This is a power, so I can plug in anything. And the rest of it is polynomial, so I can plug in anything again. So this has no solutions, okay? So I only have two critical points and I'm going to analyze the first derivative by drawing a number line, putting both of those points on. Now, of course, notice that um, t being measured in seconds after the injection means that t cannot be negative. I'm going to include this in my analysis just to get a fuller picture of what the function looks like mathematically. Uh, now, I can plug in all the different numbers in these intervals. So if I plug in something negative, I'm going to be plugging it into the derivative. Let's see what happens. 0.2 is positive. If I plug in a negative number, t will be negative. e to the negative t will be positive no matter what. And then this will be a negative number here, which will become positive with a minus in the front. So altogether, this contribution will become negative. This contribution will stay positive. So I have negative altogether. You can use a similar logic for all the other intervals, or if you prefer, you can grab a calculator and just actually plug in a number in. I find that thinking it through is actually faster in the end, because for example, again here, if I plug in a one into this entire expression, this whole part is positive, because once again, I don't even need to bother plugging anything into e to some power. That will always remain positive. And point two times one is positive. Two minus one is also positive. Positive times a positive gives me a positive. The last one will be negative. And thinking in terms of the function, that means that the function was first decreasing and then increasing and then decreasing again, producing a local minimum at zero and a local maximum at two. Okay, so this is the situation for the local extrema, which is what the first derivative analysis will give us. 
Um, local minimum at zero is not surprising. That's when the injection first happens. But let's try to think about what does it mean to have a local maximum at two? Well, that requires thinking back in what the T is measured in, and that is measured in degrees below normal temperature. So local maximum being at two means in two seconds, we have the greatest uh, difference between the measured temperature and the normal temperature. That's when the cooling down effect is the most noticeable. So in two seconds after the injection, the temperature drops the most. And this is how one can interpret the first derivative in this case. Let's now take a look at the second derivative and its analysis in order to determine potential inflection points and intervals of concavity. Um, so if you carefully take the second derivative, you should get an expression that looks like this. Once factored out, 0.2 e to the negative t, t squared minus 4t plus 2. Um, once again, you factor it out in order to be able to better analyze when it's actually equal to zero. So our potential inflection points are going to be when the second derivative is either equal to zero or does not exist. Once again, going through this, the second derivative being zero means one of the factors has to be zero. Point two is never zero. E to the negative t once again is never actually zero or negative, which means that we only need to solve for this quadratic to be zero. Now, a lot of times you are able to find nice solutions to quadratic equations. This is not one of those cases. In this case, you will have to apply a quadratic formula and it will produce two slightly um, ugly solutions, two plus or minus square root of two, which are approximately equal to 0.58 and 3.41. Okay, so those are our potential inflection points from this case. And then the second derivative does not exist. Once again, we have to look at our second derivative here. We notice that this part is just a polynomial, so you can plug in any number, and you can, of course, compute an exponential function at any number x, or t in this case, sorry. So this produces no solutions. Okay, now let's actually do the second derivative analysis on it here. So my two potential inflection points are 0.58, 3.41, and once again, you don't have to really consider the negative numbers because t here represents time and therefore cannot be negative, but it does give a better, fuller mathematical picture. Um, so if we pick a number in this region, we plug it into the second derivative here, and we have to figure out whether it's going to be positive or negative. Once again, you can use your calculator or you can, you can sort of justify it out. This entire part will always be positive, no matter what you plug in. So we really only have to figure out whether this quadratic is positive or negative for the chosen numbers. It's gonna be positive and then negative and then positive, which means that the function is concave up and then concave down and then concave up. Because the concavity actually changes at these points, we will have an inflection point at each one of those spots uh, because there are also actual points on the function. Excellent. This is our first and second derivative analysis. Remember that we want to sketch the graph. We also want to find things like x and y intercepts and asymptotes. I'm going to leave the x and y asympto um, intercepts to you. You should only get one and that will be at the origin. But for the asymptotes, for the vertical asymptote, um, there is no number that you can plug into the function to make it go to infinity except for infinity. So there's no uh, vertical asymptotes. And for horizontal asymptotes, remember that we always have to compute the limit as the variable goes to infinity of our actual function. So what happens in this case, let us rewrite e to the negative t as the actual reciprocal with the positive power as it might be e slightly easier to analyze. Okay, so I have an expression that looks like this. If I plug in what the limit tells me to compute this function at, I'm going to get infinity over infinity. This is actually one of the indeterminate forms where so-called L'Hopital's rule will be um, quite useful. We do not cover L'Hopital's rule in this course. Um, it is useful for functions like these, but there's another type of analysis that we can do here in order to figure out this limit. Um, it is infinity over infinity, but notice that the top infinity is formed by a polynomial function, why the bottom infinity is formed by an exponential function. Exponential functions grow quite a bit faster than polynomials, which means that the infinity of the, on the bottom will be a much larger infinity. So you're dividing a number by a much larger number, which will make the limit go to zero. 
with all of this in mind, um, let's try to put all of this information onto our graph. Okay, so um, what are some of the useful points where you would like to have both X and Y coordinates? Those include your critical number, your critical points, as well as your inflection points. So we would like to compute T at zero and at two as those were our local minimum and local maximum. Uh, I'd also like to know what T is at both of the inflection points so that we can sketch those on. Please take a minute here and try to put all the information that we found back onto the graph, keeping in mind the intervals of increase, decrease, as well as concavity. Okay, and when you come back, I will show you what the graph looks like. This is what a graph should look like. You notice the local minimum at zero, local maximum at two, concave up behavior at the beginning, switching to concave down between the two inflection points, coming back to concave up again. Um, whenever you have a problem situated in context, it's always a good idea to check whether your graph or your conclusions make sense within the actual problem. So remember that the temperature is measured in degrees below normal, which means that at two for our local maximum, that's when the temperature dropped the most. And then notice that afterwards it converges towards zero, zero degrees below normal means that it converges back to normal, which makes sense after a certain amount of time, the temperature in the heart will come back to normal. Especially in this particular case, it's not gonna take that long because the amount of solution injected is usually very small. Um, same for in the beginning, it increases, so the temperature goes away from normal and then comes back to it. The situation, uh, the graph seems to make sense in the situation, so this is a good common sense check just to make sure that some silly arithmetic mistake did not lead you to a completely um, misguided graph. 